Hi everyone. So today's lecture is about RNA structure. First, I would like to discuss the differences between DNA and RNA so that we can understand what makes RNA special. So the three main differences between DNA and RNA is of course the sugar that is used within the nucleotide. In DNA it's a deoxyribose, um, in RNA it's a ribose. And because the RNA retains the original age of the ribose, it, the OH group is far more catalytically active than uh, just a hydrogen and is able to base pair with uh, other, char uh, other partially charged groups. Another difference is the base composition. While DNA has A, C, T, and G, um, the RNA uses uracil instead of thiamine um, in, its, um, in its structure. And finally, because the uh, absence of the uh, absence of the OH group in the DNA and the presence of the OH group in the secondary position in uh, in the RNA ribose, the way the three dimensional structure of the sugar is different. Um, the ribose has um, um, a three prime endopucker um, pointing out of the molecule, while the C two pucker predominates in the DNA structure. Because of the 2 prime OH of ribose, the RNA, as I said, has additional um, hydrogen bonding site, uh, which is good for stabilizing RNA folding, the three-dimensional folding of an RNA molecule. It also increases the melting temperature of the RNA, so it takes a little bit more energy to separate an RNA double helix but it also makes RNA more reactive and thus more unstable um, than the DNA molecule. So because of the differences between RNA and DNA, because RNA can form um, um, more, um, a, a greater number of different three-dimensional structures than DNA, um, this influences what RNA does in the cell. So one of the examples of an RNA molecule, in this case, is a tRNA. And you can see that even though this is a single-stranded RNA molecule, it has a base paired with itself forming hairpins, and then um, has a uh, further folded because, due to the interactions between the different parts of the, of the backbone due to, due to uh, more flexible hydrogen bonding of an RNA molecule. It can assume a a very complicated three-dimensional shape that allows it to have special function in the cell. In this case, it uh, is able to fit inside a ribosome and carry the amino acid to be attached to a growing polypeptide chain. So because RNA can have different three-dimensional structures, it can have, um, um, it can fulfill function almost like a protein and folds almost like a protein. It has a secondary structure of loops um, of loops and um, hairpins, and then the structure can further fold into a tertiary three-dimensional structure, like a protein. Furthermore, due to flexibility of the backbone, um, frequent non-Watson-Crick base pairs are found in RNA molecules. So inside an RNA molecule, which is not constrained by the, um, by the double helical shape of a DNA molecule, um, adenine to adenine base pairing can be found, or guanine to uracil base pairing can be found as well. Because uh, of larger, uh, of more base pair options, um, actual binding interfaces, binding sites, or even a catalytic, catalytic active site interface can be created inside an RNA molecule, allowing RNA, some RNAs to function as ribozymes, which is sort of a play on the word enzyme, except with the RNA added into the word. So there's many different types of RNA molecules inside the cell that fulfill different, lots of different functions. Um, on the left here, there is a picture of a um, RNA gel. So this is the same, this is gel electrophoresis instead of DNA, RNA has been run out. And I would, what I want you to see is that if you remember from the DNA structure lecture, DNA was a high molecular weight band that sort of smeared a little bit due to DNA degradation during the extraction process. 
However, RNA will look different. The majority of the total RNA inside a cell is going to be ribosomal RNA. So the 28S and the 18S are the two um, ribosomal, uh, ribosomal RNAs found in eukaryotic cells. Um, the another, uh, usually uh, there's going to be a band here for the transfer RNAs, and then you can appreciate that the, le uh, the rest of the gel, the sort of many, many uh, pale haze bands that um, you see on this gel, which is the intact, the good total RNA gel, are the messenger RNAs found inside the cell because the different genes are of different lengths and they'll be made into either really small or really big or medium-sized proteins, mRNAs, mRNA, messenger RNA, comes in all kinds of sizes. So, um, and then this gel is much too loose for us to be able to see really, really small RNAs, regulatory RNAs found inside the cell, such as siRNA or microRNAs, which we'll discuss later in the course. Now, because RNA is more unstable than DNA, it uh, tends to degrade really rapidly. So if one works with RNA, one has to be extra careful not to can contaminate your sample with enzymes that degrade RNA, called RNases. So that's exactly what happened in this lane of the gel, where you see that the 18S and 28S RNA bands have almost completely degraded, and most of the RNA is found in these little shreds at the very bottom of the gel, suggesting that your RNA got destroyed in the process of extraction. And as I wanted to say, different RNA molecules have different function in the cells, and because we're also talking about structure, let's point out that um, ribosomal RNA transfer and transfer RNA have very specific three-dimensional structures that are necessary for their function in the cell, while the messenger RNA and microRNAs, as well as long non-coding RNAs, the tertiary structure doesn't matter quite so much, and it's the sequence that is important, because messenger RNA will fold into some sort of shape, but the shapes aren't stable, and they're not critical for the mRNA function. In fact, um, ribosomes would prefer if the mRNA would not be in a secondary structure because it's, it's hard to translate from a molecule that's already folded and the ribosome can't get through. Because RNA is able to have catalytic activity, um, what's called the RNA world hypothesis has been proposed fairly recently. So in the modern world, we have a very particular sequence of events inside the cell called the central dogma. DNA is the molecule that stores the information. RNA, in this case mRNA, is the molecule that is used to transfer the information from the DNA um, to the protein production machinery. And then when proteins are translated and folded into a proper protein, these are the biomolecules that um, execute all kinds of output functions necessary for cell survival. However, um, it has been proposed that in the pre-cellular world, there was no DNA and no protein quite yet, and it was the RNA that was able to both self-replicate itself, just like DNA now, as well as act out different output functions, because it can fold and create catalytic interfaces. So this RNA world hypothesis um, describes how potential life could have been created. So um, it uh, assumes that complex organic molecules were pr already produced by various random events. And when sufficient, sufficient, then when RNA was present in sufficient qual uh, quantities in very particular environments, People propose different areas like hydrothermic vents at the depth of the ocean and so forth. RNA was able to um, self-replicate itself. So it, could, it was able to create more of itself and thus propagate. And then it became a little bit more complicated when RNA um, was able to not just uh, self-replicate itself, but instruct proteins how 
uh, how, how to read the RNA and then make protein. And then finally, when DNA came into the picture, the last common ancestor, LUCA, was created. So it's a very vague hypothesis that people are still working on, but um, there's a lot of, um, lot of um, features about the RNA suggesting that the RNA world hypothesis is true. Because um, um, RNA is critical for both um, information storage and for the process of protein translation. So the ability of the RNA molecules to act as enzymes in catalyzing biochemical reaction without the involvement of protein suggests that it was most likely the first molecule that was able to self-replicate itself before life really came into existence. Um, and here I would like to point out that RNA, um, because RNA is able to fold, there's all kinds of approaches one can take with them. So one thing I want to tell you guys about is the Turner. So it's an RNA folding game that was um, created between, as a collaboration between Stanford and I think North Carolina Chapel Hill, I can't remember. Um, and it, it bases itself on the following premise. We would really like to know, the scientists would really like to know how to look at an amino acid sequence and be able to fold a protein de novo without relying on the previously known structures of sort of similar proteins. Um, but before scientists can solve that problem, scientists have decided that um, optimizing the algorithm using RNA, which only has four nucleotides as opposed to 20 amino acids, is a better approach. As a result, um, the Turner game um, uses you as the user to test their hypothesis and have you test out different folding, um, um, folding s s solutions for large RNA molecules which allows them to refine their RNA folding algorithm while it allows you, if you wish to play this game, it's free, you can just try it out, um, to have a better understa understanding and appreciation of um, RNA structure and how RNA molecules can fold. So if you, if you have spare 10 minutes, I uh, invite you to come and try out this game. It's pretty fun. So. And then another, um, another suggestion or another pillar of the RNA world hypothesis is the use of nucleotides, specifically RNA nucleotides, in very many different um, cellular processes. One of the shining examples of using of RNA um, in the cell is ATP. So ATP, I'm sure you guys remember, is the energy transfer molecule in many protein in, in many catalyst reactions used by proteins um, for many many different reasons and ATP is a universal carrier of chemical energy it's used from archaea to us um, it is what our cells produce from the nutrients we ingest we make ATP and then we use ATP to power many unfavorable favorable chemical reactions inside our cells other nucleotides used in the cells, RNA nucleotides, not DNA, always RNA, are other energy carriers and signaling molecules. So for example, when you, if you guys remember from, um, from biology, the Krebs cycle, or the basic catabolism cycle running in all of our mitochondria, uses the NAD, um, energy carrier to transfer two electrons from uh, the from the sugars to the electron transport chain um, and uses FAD to transfer one, uh, one electron um, from uh, the Krebs cycle to the electron transport chain. During, um, uh, during anabolism, so when cells make something as opposed to destroy for energy production, so for the um, uh, pentose phosphate pathway and for fatty acid synthesis, um, a molecule that's very similar to NAD, in this case NADP, is used. It has an additional phosphate on the ribose, which allows the cells to recognize which of these electron carriers is used for catalysis and which is uh, for catabolism and which is used for anabolism. And then finally, um, the uh, cyclic AMP, 
or adenosine acyclic AMP is basically an ATP molecule where the instead of three phosphates, one phosphate remains and it has been um, cyclically linked to the ribose in two positions. And cyclic AMP is a very commonly used signaling um, molecule for many uh, receptor tyrosine kinase signaling pathways such as glucagon and adrenaline signaling in our metabolism. And then, uh, so one, um, one uh, experimental approach that you need to remember for RNA structure is looking is that one can look at both DNA and RNA using either southern or northern blots. And this is a way of identifying very specific um, DNA or RNA sequences out of the total mass of the RNA. So the basic premise of the experiment is that you have your nucleic acid, say the total RNA you have extracted from a cancer cell or sorry from a brain or from a kidney or from a liver and you want to know which of these gene um, gene types is are expressed in these different organs so let's say that we're keenly interested in, in PPAR delta alpha and gamma so you extract the total RNA and you run the total RNA on this agarose gel to separate different mRNAs by size then, because agarose gel is a flimsy medium that breaks easily, you transfer your RNA um, to a more sturdy substrate. In this case, it's a nitrocellulose membrane which carries a partial positive charge and to which negatively charged uh, nucleic acids will stick. Um, you, use, you can use various approaches to transfer the RNA or DNA to your nitrocellulose membrane. The most common way is by capillary reaction. If you guys want to actually see people do it, you can look at this northern blood video here listed from YouTube. It's not the only video out there. There's many others. I just happen to like this one. And then once you have all of your total RNA stuck to the nitrocellulose membrane, you cook <laughs> the blood by heating it to high temperatures and causing the RNAs inside the cellulose membrane to unfold and be in an unfolded state, allowing a probe that you have designed specifically against your gene of interest to bind to um, the blood that you're probing. And the probe, the RNA or DNA probe that you have created has been labeled in one way or the other. The most common way is to incorporate radioactive phosphate into the probe nucleotides. And then um, you um, because radioactivity will leave a black mark on, uh, on a photographic paper, you just sandwich your nitrocellulose membrane and film together and expose them in darkness for, depends on the strength of your probe. It can be 30 seconds, it can be a few days, and you get a blot like this. And in this case, you can see that uh, the scientists looked at three different proteins, PPAR delta, alpha, and gamma, um, and they looked at different tissues, such as spleen, muscle, lung, liver, blah, blah, blah. And you can see that PPAR alpha is uh, present in high quantities in the heart, but not in the lung. While PPAR gamma is not present in the brain, but present, present in whatever these bad and left things are. <laughs> and then uh, one important thing to have on your blood is to have a loading control, because you can also get these different sizes, different intensity bands because you loaded more or less RNA on this your original gel. So all of these northern and southern blots will have a loading control. In this case it's an 18SR RNA, ribosomal RNA, which you assume to be present in equal amounts in every cell. So hopefully this was a good enough introduction to the approach of southern and northern blot. And again if you have more questions I recommend watching this northern blot video. It explains it in more detail. And then finally, here's the summary for this RNA present structure presentation um, that you guys can read yourself and you will be able to find the PDF file for this uh, um, lecture in the WIO courses. Have a great day!